To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Be mindful of your mercy, O oh Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they've been from of old. All the parts of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep your covenant and decrees. Turn to me and be gracious to me from lonely and afflicted. Will leave the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Oh, guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Word of the Lord. church. I'm here in my living room and I just wanted to talk with all of you about how we can respect our elders. So a lot of our community in the church are a little older, not a lot, just a little. And I just wanted to remind you all to continue to wear your mask. So with all of us getting our vaccines or looking forward onto getting our vaccines. We still have to remember to distance ourselves. We have to love all of God's children. One of my professors once told me, it is a blessing to get to know anybody in any stage of life. She was my hospice teacher. So you guys remember to respect your elders, say hi to all your neighbors, really get to know everyone as much as you can socially distance style. Thank you. The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. 
and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it, somehow we do it, somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time, were a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother, can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together victorious, not because we will never know, again no defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb. John 2, 13 through 25. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he did no one to testify about anyone for he himself knew what was in everyone. So why would selling animals in the temple make Jesus so mad? He makes a whip and starts chasing first all the animals out of the temple like a madman. Then he goes over to the people who were changing money and he begins to turn over the tables and he begins to dump all the money out onto the floor. 
the leadership would just claim that they were trying to make it easier for the people in worship. That's what they would say. They would say, why do we make these people schlep their animals all the way? And they did use the word schlep. All the way from home just to come into the temple and make their sacrifice. We'll just sell them the animals here. And in fact, because when you came with your animal, you had to get your animal pre-approved. These animals would just be already pre-approved and perfect for sacrifice. And of course, it wouldn't hurt the treasury either. But this would be their explanation. What is so wrong with that? But for Jesus, it was so much, much more of a problem. So a few weeks ago, <clears throat> Sue and I made a trip down to San Diego. And by the way, this is my third illustration I'm using for that trip, so it's a very worthwhile <laughs> trip. <clears throat> and, one <laughs> and one afternoon, we were seated, uh, sitting by the pool, you know, reading something, and then Across from the pool, all of a sudden, we began to hear the clamor of a flock of seagulls. They were making such a ruckus. They were beginning to gather and swarm and squawk, and everybody was noticing what was going on. And of course, soon we, <clears throat> we saw what was happening, that on, the, on a ta one of the tables, someone had just finished their lunch and left and left a few scraps there. So the scavengers congregated to begin to debate with one another who actually gets the food. So I was watching, I was intent on kind of watching what was happening, and one seagull made a dive for the table, grabbed something off the table, and his friends came to try to get him. He, he flew up and took off right towards us <clears throat> as 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 seagulls were chasing him, and <clears throat> he was so happy. I mean, I, I'm sure he had a smile on his face. I mean, he was just like going like crazy, shooting across the pool deck, and coming right out. He, he flew right over us, and I could see hanging out of his mouth was this huge slice of a red onion. <laughs> he was so happy, so happy. <clears throat> But I could just picture him getting back, you know, outrunning his neighbors, hiding finally in the corner, and taking the first bite <clears throat> out of his treasure. My guess is he was in for a surprise. That which he was so excited about a few minutes earlier now brought tears to his eyes. Huh? Yeah. We can be like that too. We can clamor after things. We can, we can be so sure that we need a certain thing or a certain item or product or fulfill some obligation. So sure that if we could just get that, we would be full. We would have what we needed. We would be complete. And then so often, just like my little seagull friend, we can get it home, we can finally have it, we can bite into it, and it just didn't taste quite the way we thought it would. <laughs> just like the serpent says in Genesis, if you take from this, you will be as gods. You will be complete. You will be whole. You will be full. That's why I called this um, sermon Deception. Because we're so easily deceived, tricked. And that philosophy seems to be getting worse. I mean, uh, if you don't have a private business, internet business making millions, or a podcast with at least 10,000 listeners, or a Twitter account with at least a million followers, I mean, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> right? So we work harder and harder, you know, trying to, told that we need to find our place in the sun. Uh, we, we need to find that thing that will make our lives worthwhile. We get our, maybe we'll even get our beaks around something that uh, promises to deliver, and then it becomes somehow terribly disappointing. So Frederick Beekner, one of my favorite authors, wrote a book a long time ago called Telling the Truth, the Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale. 
Um, he claimed that the good news must first be preceded by facing the bad news. Before we can really hear the good news, we have to be willing to face what isn't working. He calls it tragedy. The tragedy of what isn't working. So there are two ongoing human difficulties that I want to talk about that we sometimes are asked to face during the season of Lent. The first difficulty is what we just talked about. The first aspect is the frustration of not being able to get what we are so convinced we need. That no matter how hard we try, we don't seem to be able to reach our goals, not able to find what we're really hoping for. It remains just a little bit out of reach. We, we know this feeling. We, we understand what that feels like. The second difficulty is similar to this, and it's kind of connected to it. We don't talk about it as much, but that's the difficulty present when we actually get what we were hoping for, shooting for reaching for, when we actually find the goal or achieve the goal or reach the objective, sometimes we discover that it doesn't quite deliver what it seems to have promised. So human beings live in that tension between frustration or disappointment frustration of not being able to find what we feel like we really need and disappointment when we find out that what we get isn't quite what we thought it would be. And it often leads many people to a feeling of despondency or discouragement or sometimes even self-rejection. They feel that the problem is them. They either didn't try hard enough or they, they, they reach for the wrong thing. Sometimes it makes people feel like failures. So here's the news. The good news is that the bad news isn't the last news. It's important news. It's important to know where our life isn't going to come from. Here's the bad news. No goal, no objective, no pursuit, no effort, no achievement or triumph or ambition was ever meant to make us whole or complete or full or fully satisfied or even fully happy, even if we could do it perfectly. There's nothing wrong with you if you feel this way. No matter how meaningful your work is, it was never meant to produce long-lasting value or worth or significance. It was never designed to create a sense of being a significant human being. Value could only come as a gift. They're not rewards for good enough performance. Lent invites us into the reality of our own disappointments because we all have them, either of not being able to find what we think we thought we needed or actually finding what we thought we needed, but it didn't quite deliver. And so we can discover as we enter into these disappointments what we end up discovering when we're not running from them or hiding from them or pretending we don't have them, when we're not doing that, what we end up discovering is God waits for us in that place. Remember when Adam and Eve were hiding behind the trees and God comes walking, it says in the poem, in the great creation poem, God comes walking in the middle of the day, in the cool of the evening, calls to them. And they say, why? he says, why are you hiding? We're ashamed. And what does God say to them? Who convinced you you, weren't, you were unacceptable? Who convinced you you weren't good enough? You see, this was the news the community of faith was supposed to bear and share. This is why Jesus got so mad that day in the temple. Because they turned something that was supposed to be a result of God's goodness and grace and was free and unconditional and it was about love and kindness 
and they turned it into a, a merit. You have turned my father's house into a marketplace, Jesus said. And it's the very thing that continues to threaten the church today and why so many people have stopped listening to us. Because they just see it as another place to tell them that they just haven't performed well enough. Remember the famous final speech by Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz? I bet you do. Glenda comes, remember, floating in. I think it was a scarecrow that asked Dorothy what did she learn when Glenda said that she knows everything she needs to know now. And Dorothy says this, if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. Because if it isn't there, well, then I never really lost it to begin with. Sometimes we have to face down a lot of scary witches <laughs> to get there. But that's where we're headed. That's where we're being taken through all the disappointments, through all the heartache and the suffering. This is where we're being pulled. We're born into the arms of love, where we all begin. We return to the arms of love when our journey is finished. And in between, we are always being called back to recognize that the gift of unconditional love and belonging is our true home. And we battle through a variety of distractions to come home to that place. Creator God, we come to you in this, the February of our pandemic year. For some of us, a time of loss, a time of uncertainty, a time of fear. For all of us, a time when we long to touch each of our friends and all of our family, to worship again, together, in person, to join together, in person, for celebrations and gatherings. Help us to remember that spring is almost here. Flowers are blooming, the grass is green. Help us to remember that this pandemic will not go on forever, that Easter is coming with its promise of new life. Sometimes it can be very hard for us to remember the promise of Easter, and we need your help. Hear us as we pray together the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the God of surprise and new life bring you hope today. May the Christ of faithfulness and righteousness expand your love today. May the spirit of steadfastness and encouragement welcome you to unity today. Let the wonder of the God who is one, the God who is three, fill you, restore, renew, and refresh. Love comes. Light shines. The miracle of God dances around us. In the name of the God who is love, the Son who is peace, and the Spirit who is life, fill you and keep you now and forevermore. Amen. Grace and peace be with you.